So, uh, like I said yesterday, uh, there were four films that I wanted, uh, and this was definitely one of them. It showed at Tribeca, and it was a huge hit, and we said, holy shit. Uh, we all think about Cuba all the time and Cuban car culture. We'd heard so much, and there's so much myth, I think, and there's so many weird ideas about it, some true, some not. Uh, and we were thinking about who could moderate the, the panel. Uh, we thought, well, Jason would be perfect, both because he does very weird things with cars uh, and because if you don't know this, Jason Torchinsky, amazing writer, editor, uh, etc. His father uh, actually came over from Cuba. He went Russia, Cuba, because he couldn't get into the United States, America. So. Jason Torchinsky actually half Cuban, which is uh, kind of amazing. Uh, for this panel, we'll uh, have a translator. We'll be translating a little bit, and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A with the audience if you guys have any questions uh, after they talk a little bit. But uh, take it away, Jason. Thanks a lot. I'm uh, really excited about this movie and to be uh, moderating this panel, partially because my dad was Cuban. Um, he, of course, never spoke Spanish at home other than Merd, and he sounded a little bit like Scarface, and that was about as far as it went as far as him being Cuban. But for anybody who loves cars in America, uh, Cuba's always held this special place because we see pictures of these old, mostly American cars being held together, and they just keep going and going, and the ingenuity of Cuban mechanics is something, I think, so I've got a few cars from the 70s, and anytime I can't get one working, part of me always feels bad because I know somewhere out there, there's a Cuban guy holding a car together that's 40 years older with a, something that fell out of a Lada and some, you know, mucus. And, you know, when I can't do that, I realize these guys really are doing something absolutely amazing. And the kinds of the cars that we see there are things that just aren't common on roads anymore here. The weird Frankenstein hybrids of Lada parts and old American parts, all of those things are fascinating to us. So we've kind of been appreciating this strange culture from afar, and we've been able to enjoy it in a way that, if we reflect on it, isn't really that fair, because honestly, for everybody in Cuba, it probably kind of sucked. It probably was very difficult and frustrating to try to do things. So how is the, um, how do you guys feel about, do you, how much awareness is there in Cuba of how the rest of the world sees the car culture that you have? Uh, I won't respond to that directly. I think the two racers should respond to it. Um, but first, I just wanted to introduce them uh, so you know who oh, they yeah, are. Oh, yeah, sorry uh, about that. I should okay. have been introduced. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm BJ Perlmutt. I'm the director and producer of the film. And, and this is Carlos Alvarez, who is one of the racers who races the Porsche and uh, the, the Chevy uh, in the film. This is uh, Armando uh, Munet, who is the, another of the racers who has the, the Ford Crown Victoria. And this uh, PT, he's known by in the film. Um, and this is Julio Perez, who is uh, one of our incredible editors. Um, so I'll turn it over to one of these guys. Yeah, give it up, please. These guys are amazing. What do we think that you all think about our car culture? Well, we hope that you know us, A, that we exist. There's a big fan base for American cars. We take care of the cars. You know, the, the tricky part with the economic situation is the gas. But we always continue with V8 cars, which is what the cars are, how they were originally made. And, you know, you know, for me primarily, there's never going to, you know, we're always going to desire a V8 car. And I love the power of American cars. We're very big fans of American cars, of hot rods. And, you know, my personal favorite is the Mustang. Okay, that's great. And, and for me personally, uh, one of the attractions uh, that I had to this story was, we all know that the cars exist in Cuba. We all know that they do amazing things to these cars to keep them on the streets. Uh, but not only are these guys maintaining these cars, they're, they're actually preparing them to, to race very fast, which is a feat in itself. And so I think we had a, a very built-in uh, dramatic arc with with this uh, idea of not only are they you know able to preserve the cars but they're able to customize them in their own way with their limited resources uh, to race each other 
And speaking of that, so we saw kind of the birth of racing in Cuba, at least drag racing in an organized way. How is it now? The movie was finished in when? 2012? Late 2012? Uh, the, this race happened in January of 2013. The, okay, so yeah. what's been happening since then? Have there been more races? Is it growing? Well, I can let them answer, but um, I was just in Cuba two months ago, and, and after this major race, uh, the car clubs themselves started having more and more uh, more informal races uh, every weekend. And we all hope that uh, that would build momentum to have more bigger races like the one you see at the end of the film. Uh, but unfortunately, in the past four or five months, they've, they've banned all races again, and, and they don't really give a reason why. And, and it's really hard to get an answer when there will be a race. Um, but there hasn't been any races or legal races uh, in many months there. So we're hoping, you know, to help these guys promote racing by showing the film uh, all over Cuba in the next upcoming months and, and hopefully get the government themselves excited about the film because the Ministry of Sports there is finally recognizing it as a sport of the people, um, but now they have to you know, commit to building an infrastructure to make it as safe as possible. The future of racing in Cuba is uncertain. After this film, you know, it took two years to make. It started in 2013. You know, there was lots of work on Ben. His entire team went to Cuba. For me, it's sad. You know, the speed races, the government has taken, taken it as a political situation, a political issue. And it has nothing to do with politics. You know, people from the outside are looking, it has nothing to do with politics. The car culture is a, is a culture that, you know, the people like. But the government sees that it's, when they see that there's no economic impact in these endeavors, they kind of just ignore you. So we suffer because it's something that we like. I don't like soccer, but... It's incredible that you all have seen this, this film, that nothing is made up. We were not told to do certain things or say certain things. This is really the way it works. This is really our lives. And we keep fighting because, you know, look at this. It's 2015 and they still won't let us race. The primary issue, I think, with the uh, race in Temisa, kind of the way it played out, it was great that Carlos could finish, but if you really pay attention, you can see that I or Ecobede or the Hot Rod, they didn't let us race. They suspended us. So at the end, it's a nice race, but it's, you know, we didn't get to participate. As always, they suspended us. I think we should give a big thanks to Ben and his entire production team because basically that race happened because the justification was the film that we were making. The race wouldn't have happened on its own, so it's really because of the film. And truthfully, the race in Temisa was an issue of convenience. Temisa used to be a part of the province called Pina del Rio, but they went independent. So they bring us to that race, they brought us to that race to get the city excited. You know, just for us to go and say, listen, your independence and this activity is important. And we always support as much as we can. We support the Cinco Héroes projects. We're always there to kind of supplement Whatever we can supplement, we'll take the cars if we need to. It just brings lots of the public out when we come and support. Now, is anyone noting the irony of the Cuban government not being interested in racing because there's no profit from it when clearly it's about as populist and people-oriented as possible? It's kind of the exact opposite of the reason they banned racing in the first place, and is, which is maddening. Yeah, I mean... For me personally, I heard 10 different reasons why racing didn't exist. And I think the most extreme is that it is still considered a, an elitist sport and a sport uh, that's frowned upon in, in Cuba. But I think the more practical reason is the government doesn't want to put money into creating these simple tracks. And I believe the government, as is, has nothing to do with these races. 
it's the lower rungs that are below the official government. It never goes that high. It's always the people below. The government's in charge of the hospitals, social services, schools. Here, for example, like you did with the Miatas, a group of people get together, you plan it, you organize, and it happens. There, that's not the way it works. There, we'll get together, a couple of us will get together to have an event, and Kiko or whoever has a little more power than me will come, they'll check it out, and then they turn it off. Everything now has to be like an exhibition. What they do now is they'll take us to town so that everybody can see our cars. We don't want to do that, so we don't show up. I believe when the film is out, when we can see it on television, hopefully it'll function as a way for people to sit down and think about the races in Cuba. I also think that the new relationship between the U.S. and Cuba, hopefully things will get better. There'll be more of an interchange with tourism, kind of like we are exchanging with you. Thank God I'm able to come here and do this exchange. And hopefully we'll do the same on our side. Sometimes, you know, we are painted poorly on your side and you all are painted poorly on our side. But in reality, we're all the same. You all have treated me so wonderfully, and it's just been such a great experience here. Yeah, go ahead, give it up. These guys are amazing. Absolutely. So let's let's shift gears just a little bit. Was there ever a rematch between that Porsche Bel Air race that we saw at the end of the race? Was there ever a rematch? Did that ever get settled? These guys race unofficially all the time, and uh, depending on you know the week. Uh, someone else is the champion. So we decided to end the film with this historic event, yeah, even though yeah. we could have had, you know, maybe Carlos wins the next time, maybe Ray wins the next time. Um, Eduardo, who's featured in the film, he's considered the, the champion today. Um, uh, uh, some Swiss guy just brought in a Maserati, which apparently <laughs> is giving a lot of competition. There's a new BMW that's... Uh, pretty fast and so you know every every week there's there's a new competitor I believe the government as is has nothing to do with these races it's always the people below the government's in charge of the hospitals social services schools here for example like you did with the Miatas a group of people get together you plan it you organize and it happens there that's not the way it works there we'll get together a couple of us will get together to have an event and Kiko or whoever has a little more power than me will come they'll check it out and then they turn it off everything now has to to be like an exhibition. What they do now is they'll take us to town so that everybody can see our cars. We don't want to do that, so we don't show up. And, you know, car racing is, is important. It's good. Because if not, we do these V8 races alone. Or we are just racing against the clock. And at the end of the day, nobody races against anybody. Let me explain a little bit better. Now, for example, if Carlos and I were to find out that Saul was able to get a couple of pieces for his car, or the right tools, well, we hide. Because if we see that he's running against the timer and he's running faster than we are, we just won't race against him. We don't want to lose. I, I don't want to lose my self-esteem. <laughs> I, I don't want to lose just because I don't have a sponsor. And, and I think this idea of a patron, uh, I think we were very lucky to capture with Carlos and Saul because it showed sort of the bigger picture in Cuba and particularly the relationship between the US and Cuba and how you know the more we open up to Cuba the more patronage is possible there um, and I don't think we could make this film today the same way because I keep hearing about Cuban Americans and and other foreigners coming in and just pouring a ton of money into making sure their racer is uh, you know ha has the fastest car um, so I think we were lucky to capture a time in Cuban history where people were still, you know, using their ingenuity over everything else to, to build these cars. So you think that this era is, is going to be gone soon? The era of just, just raw brains and whatever you can find putting together to make a car go? Is that, how, how much longer do you think we've got that? Or is it already gone? Well, Ray, the guy you see racing at the end, he hasn't raced since this race because he felt he couldn't compete anymore and he was pouring all of his resources, but people 
you know, kept on building newer cars. And so, yeah, I, I see it personally, but I'm curious what these guys have to say, because PT is a good example of someone who's never been affected by any of these changes as far as his desire to race others. And he's not in it to, to win. He, he loves to participate. Uh, there was the scene where the cop pulls him over, and the cop is actually surprisingly quite cool. And like looking at the engine, and said if it had wings, it would take off. How common is that? Are the highway patrol people generally sympathetic, or I, mean, I imagine it must vary as well? Who doesn't like the evil and the illegal sometimes? You know, sometimes people like it, and that includes the police. There are four or five racers, and you know, Havana's small, and we've been around for a while. And we basically know all of the police stations. You know, they see me with my son and with my wife. So they, they let you go because, you know, the car is beautiful and they like the car. You know, I wish we could do a second part to the film because we've done so many transformations to the cars currently. Now we've been able to add a Morrison chassis to one of the cars. I've been able to find some semi-slick tires. You know, the, the car runs better. We're, we're ready to race again, but they won't let us. We have even have nitrous in Cuba. Okay, that's great. Nitrous is in Cuba. We're even going to the hospitals looking for it. My car currently is broken because instead of nitrous, it looks like they filled it with mud and the whole engine exploded. Well, then, you, what did you try instead of nitro? There are some pieces that they let enter through Cuba. So we buy them via, you know, the Summit Racing magazines. So we bought a nitrous kit. We uh, tried it out in my car. And the motor just exploded because the nitrous container wasn't filled with nitrous. It was filled with something else. What was it? Do you have any idea? Any idea what it was? I think it was uh, CO2 or something from the hospital. Oh, nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxygen, nitrous oxide. So I was going 150 kilometers an hour when I pressed the button to activate the system. The only thing I did, I almost lost my head. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but that's terrible. So I have to ask uh, Carlos a question. Uh, now, the, the Porsche 944 that you had, how, how the hell did that even end up there? Oh, ese carro realmente lo lo llevó un marinero, uh, lo llevó a país. A, 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 a seaman took sí, it. Hace, hace mucho tiempo. A long time ago. Y lo tenía otra persona y después lo compró Saúl. Another y person ahí had se, it. Se Saul preparó para it, correr. And then we kind of modify it to race. Wait, what? How did it get in there again? Uh, a sailor, a, a seaman. A sailor I, just ¿quién? took a Porsche. No, no sé quién fue, no sé quién fue. He doesn't know who it was. <laughs> Sometimes it's best not to investigate how it exactly got there. It's better not to look into those things. <laughs> Let's just say it was called a Mitsubishi for the first time. Yeah, if we start to talk about this, we won't have a phone or a Porsche. We won't have anything. We're not going to have anything if we keep asking those questions. El carro realmente no es un Porsche, es un Mitsubishi. The car is really not a Porsche, it's a Mitsubishi. Oh, sure, yeah. He still yeah. calls it a Mitsubishi. That's right, I was... Yeah, I, I forgot. Se, I, se lo I should have known. I, that's a cult. In Cuba, you can't put the engine that you want to put into the car. It has to be the engine that came from 1956. The authorities, they always check the VIN numbers. It's not like here, where if you wanted to put an airplane engine into the car, they'd let you. Well, it is a very cool Mitsubishi 944 that you have, absolutely. <laughs> Um, all right, we'll do one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, my one quick question is, I noticed at the end there was, uh, and we've, in, uh, the, what we mostly were following in the movie were the people using the big old American cars that we normally associate. But then I saw in the race there were guys running modified Lottos and other Russian cars. Is there a big rivalry between the American car guys and the Lotta Soviet bloc guys? Huge. Oh, really? Every single car club there wanted us to film their cars, and they always tried to show us why their cars blew these guys out of the water. And uh, we could have made 10 different films with 10 different types of cars in Cuba, and, and we decided to go with the heavyweights because we, we felt it, it showed the, the, um, you know, the biggest picture as far as what's happening in Cuba today, um, particularly since we did have the modern car going there was against that, the old car. that Fiat 126 racing against a Bel Air, which is one of the most hilarious drag races I've ever seen in my life. 
la carrera del... Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people want us to do a series, and I think it would be really fun to focus on different types of cars, because each, each car club is its own little community in Cuba, and, and that's what I love about the clubs. Uh, it's, it's a way of, you know, sharing a, a shared interest. And I met all these guys in the same club, um, but I could have very easily met other racers in a different club before, and this would have been a totally different movie. I'm no longer a member of a club. I just kind of got tired and just don't believe in it anymore. You know, everybody does what's convenient to them. And now it's gotten very commercial with the tourists and the convertible cars. You know, they drive around Havana. And that, that's all nice. And, you know, that makes money. But it's not something that we enjoy. In the U.S., you know, they should really work with Cuba to work on these fast cars. Cuba's looking at the Chinese cars, but what we like are the American cars. There are definitely differences between the old cars that are V8s. That's what's most uh, attractive. Those clubs, those cars are the ones that are most attractive to the public. But it's also the enemy to the small cars, because we show up and then no one wants to look at the other cars. Um, okay, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience now, and uh, I'll give Matt the mic. Uh, does anybody have a question? Oh, lots of questions. All right. I'm going to Vanna White this. Uh, so start with Jacob Brown from Austin. With uh, sanctions opening up in uh, between Cuba and the U.S., are you hopeful that um, there will be a, a greater ability to get parts and, and get more American cars, anything from the U.S. in Cuba? You know, it's already kind of open. It's organized so that you can bring parts into Cuba. The problem is is wages, salaries in Cuba, people aren't making enough money to buy these pieces. For example, a doctor, let's say maybe, you know, who's making the most amount of money is making something like 50 bucks a month. So it's just not much. So here in Miami, they're charging you at the airport $2 a pound for the things that you're shipping. And then if it's a boat, it's something like two seventy a pound. And then again, when the piece arrives to Cuba, you have to pay again. You know, that's kind of why it takes so long between one race and the next. It's just very hard to organize the car. You, you spend a year accumulating money to buy the pieces. If they were to let us, you know, let's say every Sunday, if they were to let us race every Sunday, you know, there are lots of guys with Russian cars. They have four carburetors. They've at, attached turbos to the cars. Right now we're doing um, a race on a gathering on Fridays, and it's not a race, but it's really like who can do a better 360 donut and then we give out prizes for that yeah a couple months ago we actually showed the film at this event on friday night and 2500 people showed up for it and uh we were just part of of many activities there um but they started the the projection at midnight and and it was pretty wild to have the whole audience watch it until two in the morning um, and then have a, a dance contest after <laughs> the dance contest here is going to be awesome by the way uh, that's at the bar afterwards. Uh, next question over here. All right. Good evening. In the movie, we see the story of the Black Widow. That, you know, ends kind of sad. Are there more opportunities for people like him to possibly kind of, you know, move forward in this field, or has it been contaminated by outsiders? You know, now that there are other, you know, other countries' influences. Is this an evolution of the sport, or is it a contamination of the sport? Oh, the Black Widow. Hoti, yes. You know, you saw he was on a motorcycle. He has a bandaged hand. You know, they've had to insert meat from his glute into his hand, and now they're going to take some from his leg also. And he's opened his garage again. He does the fenders of the cars, you know, 1956, the old cars. All of the chrome, this is what he specializes in. He's very, very talented. And, you know, he's very talented. He can make them identical, the, the, the fenders of these things, 52s, 56 Chevys, they look beautiful. So from the film you see, he's tried really hard to get here, he's been working really hard to try to get here, but the film also shows that he's reopened his garage. He's been putting together cars, we've all been helping him, but he's really kind of gotten back on the horse. Ben has really tried to get them to be able to travel to the U.S., but they've rejected his visa. 
You know, the reason is, is that the Coast Guard has caught him. So, you know, he can't travel anymore. He wants to come. He wants to go to Venezuela and maybe try to go from Venezuela here. But, you know, that's tricky. And, and also Mexico, he was going to pay, I think, $12,000 to go through Mexico. And, uh, you know, when we were filming with him, he would disappear for days on end. And I think he tried to leave uh, nine times while we were filming and then several times after. Um, but I saw him also a couple months ago. And, and, you know, one thing we didn't cover too much in the film, I mean, you can see it because his hand's like this the whole time, but he almost had to have his hand amputated and he was just always in pain and not able to do his job. And I think that was affecting his mood a lot too. Um, but he has had a successful surgery. So I think, you know, things are looking up for him. And, um, and the car he's starting to rebuild too and he's already started converted and has bought a new motor so we're hopeful he'll keep racing too he wanted to amputate his hand but we really insisted that he not and you know we really kind of encourage him we've seen you know what's happened and there are setbacks all the time we had one eight months ago and, and I really think that he's going to, you know, end up better in the end. I think if he were to have a patron, he would be an incredible racer because he's got a very big heart. Another question over here. All right. Has anybody had a chance to um, take the, our visitors here uh, to any event that's like an H NHRA or a full-on hardcore racing or anything like that, that they can like kind of see how we've been doing it pretty much for the last 30 years. It's what we've dreamed for the most, but we just haven't been able to make it happen this trip. If you have a fast car you want to let me borrow, let me know. We can do it now. Um, yesterday, they were able to test out 2016 Miatas, but they could only go 25 miles per hour <laughs> around some cones. Sí, um, no. cuando, cuando lo acerele, que lo torcí un poco atrás, de, de, de nada me lo quitan. No, so, no dejaron pasar de 25 millas. They didn't let us go over 25 miles an hour, and um, if I were to get the back to, you know, the back end to swivel a little bit, they would take it away from me. I was told specifically, do not let them go 25 miles per, over, over 25 uh, by the Mazda people. Um, but with that said, you know, we, we did go to the uh, NHRA museum today. We went to the Peterson Museum yesterday and got a nice private tour. Uh, in, in Detroit, we got tours of a lot of different museums, and, and, and that was probably the most exciting for them in Detroit, because at midnight, they let us drive some cars really fast around the streets of Detroit. So. Don't tell my girlfriend. We were in a Mustang with Ben, but of course they wouldn't let us go over the speed limit. I saw a program in Cuba called De Cacharro a Cachazo, I think by Barry White. And on the show, I saw this museum, something about NHRA Museum in LA. And I thought to myself, how amazing would it be if one day if I were to go? And look, Ben, he took me. We looked into races, but there are no races this week. Legal. Talk to us if you know of another race. Well, tomorrow there's a race at Willow Springs, Drift event. Oh, that's a great Ah, uh, don't tell these guys in Spanish that. Uh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we're heading to Milwaukee to, for another festival, so uh, sadly no, no races for us this trip. But uh-oh, uh maybe, maybe we'll miss the flight. We can race in the middle of the night. We're leaving at 5 o'clock in the morning, but if you're telling me that there's a race to be had, we can get another flight? This is Los Angeles. You can find a race anywhere. Now that the U.S. and Cuba are aligning themselves a little bit more, do you think it'd be possible for a professional from here, from the States, to go to Cuba and teach people how to do this safely and properly, how to design the courses, the tracks, you know, just so that you all don't have problems? Do you think that would be possible? In all honesty, you know, Cuba was basically one of the first in 58 and 59 and 57. You know, the professional races were happening on the Malecon. Um, these were some of the best racers in the world. Cuba knows how to do this. Some of the best racers from Cuba, they basically came to Miami. I had the grand pleasure of meeting Gallego Cabrera, who's 83 years old. He's still alive. I met him here in Miami. I had dinner with him at his home. It was great. You know, they stopped doing these races during the revolution because they would identify this as something that only millionaires would do. With the revolution, you know, I, I'm a person. I'm a poor person. And if what I want to do is get a carburetor as opposed to eat, if that's what I like, that's what I like. 
it's going to take a while before we really actually get to the professionalism we need because it takes a lot of changing of minds and hearts. It'll just take a long time before they really approve professional racing. No, but I do think, um, to answer your question, um, they're eager to have more classes there and they're eager to develop a, a racing culture. And I think if there were professionals to come to Cuba, uh, the authorities would allow them to have these classes because that's the biggest fear of the authorities, that they're not trained well enough to, to race. So I think you know, they would accept people to, to come to Cuba with open arms for that sort of exchange. Um, PT wanted me to mention tomorrow night, for example, Anthony Bourdain, he has a show that was, uh, his, his premiere is set in Cuba, and uh, it's, you know, it's about cooking, but, but I think one day he went out with PT and Eduardo from our film, and, and they showed him how fast they can go. So, so, you know, they are very excited to have more people uh, from the U.S. come and, and, and collaborate with them. Cool. All right. I think we're going to do two more questions, uh, and then we're, we're running a little over, and we'll go to the next thing. Um, and also, thank you to whomever is t texting me underground races in Los Angeles they could go to tonight. <laughs> 50 yeah, okay. the Talk right to there. us later. If you're serious, take me. I'm thirsty, I'm a little hungry, but that's not going to keep me from racing. I'm serious. In Cuba, we don't sleep so that we can race a car. If it means us not sleeping for a night here, not a big deal. We're used to it. You guys figure it out and let us know. And, and um, just because there hasn't been any questions uh, for our, our editor, I just wanted to thank him again because uh, he, he was actually responsible for editing the final film, uh, final scene which uh, he came up with the idea to show how we were gonna you know, capture this tie and how we were gonna do a replay, which normally you don't see in, in, in documentaries. Um, and that's one of the few scenes that would never change, no matter how many you know, rounds of editing we did. And, and he's, he's responsible for dozens of those sort of scenes in the film. So thank you again, Julio, and it's good to see you. My He's pleasure. Also, it's an honor to be here. American too, yeah. It's an honor to be here con mis hermanos cubanos. I'm just excited to be here and, and uh, give voice to BJ's vision and, and give a voice to these guys who have been voiceless too long in Cuba. So, it's my pleasure. Cool. All right. Uh, one more. Well, two more questions. You guys definitely have the people and the passion, and it seems like everyone's easy to organize, but do you guys need any safety equipment? Like, what other logistical barriers do you have to racing? Like, you weren't able to get barricades because the Pope was around. Uh, is there simpler stuff like fire suits, helmets, that uh, we could just send down? You know, sometimes I just think they don't want to do it. Because right now in Cuba, there are two abandoned racetracks. And if they were to give them to us, I think lots of people, even foreigners, would help us repave it. But what we ourselves don't have is money, an, an economy that works for this. To put gas in them, we use gas from the airplanes that fumigate the fields. You know, that, that, that gasoline, they don't sell it, so we have to go to the black market and find it. Ben came to help make this film, and now I have an American friend, you know, a, a brother. But I've, I've had some pretty wild offers. Uh, SEMA, for example, the, the auto parts shop, they, they want to work with the Chamber of Commerce to bring 150,000 uh, motors to replace some of the old motors in Cuba. And it sounds exciting and great, but it's just a logistical nightmare because, you know, what happens is the, the counterpart in Cuba will say, well, you know, before we have good motors, we need good roads. And before we have good roads, we need, you know, more asphalt. And it's just, there's a lot of other more basic things they need than, you know, 150,000 motors. It'd be great if the motors were donated and they got to the person who really liked them or needed the motors. Because really, you know, as you can see, there's not that much security around these tracks. So people stand wherever they want to stand. And if the car kind of goes out and hits you, that's, that's your own problem. I'd prefer for you to stop babying me or trying to take care of me and just let me race.
because the car is mine. You all don't give me anything. Before, they used to say that you could race for 1,000 meters. Now they've lowered it to 400 meters. Now we're racing 200 meters. And they still tell us no. And all we're doing is racing 200 meters. I think even if someone were to appear to give us the motors and set up all the regulations, there's still going to be someone there that's going to say, nope. You know, what's more dangerous is boxing. They've removed their helmets. They send them to the Olympics. The reason they like it is because of the money. If it's possible, and for example, to send something, the way to do it would be to send it with someone that we know, for example, Ben. But if you try it a different way, what happens is it, it won't get to us. The people who see it and want it, they'll keep it for themselves. It's got to be sent through someone that we know, that we know will deliver the, the products to us. It's easy to do. Ben could come on a trip and he can just hand it to us you know, directly. If you try to do it a different way, it'll never work. They'll, the pieces will never get to us. You know, we're no one special. We're just uh, another part of society, and they won't treat us specially and get the things to us if we want them. We are the dangerous people of the street. Yeah, no, I, I, I've brought them the most random things, but, but he's right. I mean, if I'm not hand-delivering him things, then there's a risk that he won't get them unless it's through someone very trustworthy. Um, but it's a problem when it's a, on a bigger level because you can only bring up to $10,000 in cash and goods uh, at a time, and you can only bring a certain amount of, obviously, amount of uh, weight on the, on the plane, which makes it hard to bring in many car parts, obviously. Um, part of the Porsche, Porsche's motor, which is a Chevrolet, was disassembled in order to get it uh, on the airplane, and, and Carlos had to build, I think, take 40,000 uh, 40, pieces or something and put them back together in order to recreate the motor. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very complicated to send things to Cuba unless you're doing it you know, on the ground. Um, but I do think the post office just normalized relations with Cuba along with everything else a couple weeks ago. So maybe that will at least make shipping parcels uh, easier so you could ship something directly to PT or whoever. Jalopnik Film Festival Havana 2016. Uh, one last question from the audience. Um, <clears throat> we got a fast car. We'll let you drive if you're down. Just come talk to us. Tenemos un carro recio afuera si quieres manejar. Te lo prestamos por un rato. Es an E63 AMG wagon. Yeah. And, and on that bombshell note, I would like to remind everyone that this was filmed. Tipo de carro? Oh, Mercedes E63 wagon. Okay, okay. We filmed this for the future at 5 o'clock on a Sunday. There's much racing going on at legal circuits in California. <laughs> Applaud if you know that is true. Me dijeron que California era la meca, lo máximo de los carros, pero no no lo no lo podido ver. So he's saying, you know, they've always told me that Los Angeles is the heart of the cars, but I've yet to see it. This is going to be fun when everyone's thrown into an American prison. <laughs> uh, this was amazing. Wait, uh, one more. Do you say one more thing? Or no, we're good. All right. Just thank uh, everyone, you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. This went like an hour. It was awesome. Thank you, Victor, for translating.